before before we get started, I just wanted to dedicate tonight to Juan Flores, um, who a wonderful mentor and friend who we lost early earlier this week. And I don't know if I can say too much more, but he um, he was my my Woodrow Wilson fellow mentor and hosted me at NYU for the year while I was writing the book. And um, he read every page, gave me feedback. That was in 2010. And then from there, we just developed a wonderful friendship. And um, I know his spirit is here tonight mm -hmm. with us. So I, I will um, briefly introduce, we have um, two um, distinguished uh, panelists and I will introduce them briefly and they will make uh, some comments about uh, Julia Burgos and about the book. The, our first speaker is uh, Professor Richard Perez. He is Associate Professor of English and Director of the U.S. Latino and uh, Literature Minor in uh, John Jay College here at City University. And uh, Professor Perez has edited, uh, co-edited two critical anthologies, Contemporary U.S. Latino Latina Criticism and Moments of Magical Realism in U.S. Ethnic Literatures. Among his other publications, I will just mention a recent article titled The Debt of Memory, Reparations, Imagination, and History in Toni Morrison's Beloved. So, Professor Richard Perez. Thank you. Uh, first, um, I want to say what an honor it is and to be able to speak about uh, what I consider uh, an enormously important breakthrough in uh, Julia de Burgos' um, scholarship. Um, I want to thank the Centro for having me, for Vanessa Perez uh, for inviting me and giving me the kind of uh, leeway to wrestle with this wonderful text. Um, but before I talk about uh, the text and uh, just a kind of series of short reflections, um, I do want to say something about Juan Flores, who is um, a figure who played an important role, not only in my life, uh, but really kind of formed uh, the field and formed so many scholars of our generation. Um, and while I can't go into detail, I do want to express my condolences to his family, to our field, and to our community uh, for the loss of such a towering figure. Uh, indeed, one of my last uh, and very fond memories of Juan is sitting with him in a bar on 35th Street discussing Miguel Pinheiro in relation to Walt Whitman, exploring the ways in which Pinheiro's poetry effectively shifted our sense of American optimism. Uh, in Whitman. So it's, it, he, he was this kind of extraordinary figure who had this incredible range. Um, but tonight also marks a kind of celebration, right? So I want to kind of try to shift the affect of energy too uh, and to celebrate this extraordinary achievement um, by Vanessa uh, because what she does is she creates a hermeneutic shift in the way we approach Julia de Burgos. And this shift is not just in how we understand the life of Julia de Burgos. We know its details. Indeed, there is a way in which the very mention of Julia de Burgos incites the story of her life, a story that dominates, dominates our relation to her and to some extent overshadows the gift she gives to all of us, which is her poetry. This, I contend, sits at the heart of Vanessa Perez's significant contribution for even as her text presents Burgos's life, gives historical context, and so on, it does, it, it does so to provide interpretive tools so we, first and foremost, learn how to read Burgos's poetry. And anyone who has immersed themselves in de Burgos's work knows there's a level of complexity we have to navigate. Because for de Burgos, complexity signals the imaginative attempt to unhinge and unhouse the reader, to jar us out of our given realities and thus set 
set off a process of transformation central to a liberatory existence. We know that liberation, not just in a simple political sense, as a decree or a declaration, <coughs> forms the ontological basis of her poetic, poetic project. How does reading free us? This is an extraordinarily important question, I think. And in a time where uh, being distracted has become kind of the mode of our existence, right? Um, since as de Burgo shows, there is an attention and concentration required for self and social transformation. This is to me the fundamental, fundamental contribution of, of becoming Julia de Burgos. It teaches us how to read this great poet's work and teaches us how to read Julia de Burgos is an ambitious task. Ven Vanessa does this by mobilizing a series of tropes or metaphors that identify a process of delinking the subject. Julia de Burgos, and by extension the reader, from certain uh, heteronormative patriarchal injunctions. She grounds her reader, her reading of de Burgos, by first naming her a nomadic subject, without ties that bind or bound her into a predisposed life or identity or cultural positioning. And from this idea of a nomadic life and sensibility, Vanessa is able to generate a series of theoretical terms which she moves fluidly in and out of, from feminism to sexile, to transnational politics practices, to literary legacies, to the question of remembrance, to the creating of contemporary modes of Latinidad. So you can see the rigorous breadth of her project, and I'm talking about Vanessa's, a breadth made necessary in large part by the de Burgos, by de Burgos's own poetry. When you read de Burgos, it feels like you've jumped off the proverbial cliff because her poetry in an almost cosmic sense asks us to embrace not just one singularity or cultural place or historical moment, but what she likes to call infinity. For most poets, when you use a term like infinity, it sounds pretentious. And when you read it in de Burgos, you're blown away by the kind of uncanny revelation and, and potential um, in the way she uses it. Um, as her poetry is thinking about physics, as if her poetry is thinking about physics, about theories of relativity or dimensions of liberatory realities, she is Stephen Hawking before Stephen Hawking. And what is wonderful about Vanessa's readings is de Burgos, uh, of de Burgos is that each chapter expands taking up another symbol or metaphor or dimension of de Burgos, as if theoretically living up to de Burgos' cosmic challenges, unabashedly entering <laughs> into new hermeneutic terrains. I have to say, after reading Vanessa's book, I realized there's something terrifying about what de Burgos' poetry asks of us, a kind of utter commitment to transformation. Yet once you settle down, you realize that more horrifying still is to live without having read her. Because it seems to me that one of the things that Burgos' poetry does is, ch is change our relation to time itself. You see this in Vanessa, in, in how Vanessa Dita, uh, deals with, with de Burgos. She's unrelenting in her interpretive pursuit of, of de Burgos. She's nomadic, Vanessa tells us. She's a sexile. She lives in sexile. She's iconic. She's extra national. And this is all to say she's a symbol of becoming. What does she mean by becoming? Why does she choose to title her book in the future tense as if to suggest that de Burgos or some aspect of de Burgos has yet to come is still part of a horizon that we as a community, as a community of readers, have yet to reach? The reason de Burgos' poetry is so utterly important is not because she speaks to us from the past, and this is, this is incredibly important to me as a reader of de Burgos, but I also glean this from the text, from Vanessa's text. It's not that she speaks to us from the past, but from the future. Her work addresses us from the future. This is why she is a poet and not a historian. As a poet, she reconfigures, reconfigures her relation to time in nomadic and sexilic terms. 
If the past in a historical sense informs the present, makes the present aware of who or what preceded it, it also It also, and this is the danger that Burgos recognized in certain forms of historical discourse and tradition, imposes itself on the present, creates a toxic debt, debt from which the present cannot wrench itself. So the present, like Lot's wife in the Bible, turns to stone, stays trapped by a fetishized past that weighs it down, that enforces patriarchal tradition into a conformed now. This is why uh, Vanessa's book rightly begins analyzing the rigid male-centered nationalist movement in Puerto Rico in the 1930s, and why de Burgos turns to lyric poetry, because lyric poetry allows her to break, to use Vanessa's phrase, break with the past, and thereby access a language of self and social transformation unavailable in traditional and sometimes historical forms of speech. For lyric poetry, not only addresses a self, but a beyond, what de Burgos calls an unfettered moment, where she teaches us to die in order to live, so that the, po the poetic generates life beyond the life we are currently in, to allow parts of ourselves that no longer work to perish and affirm new potentialities, to access whatever is divine or cosmic or infinite in ourselves, to make us receptive to our futures for in de Burgos poetry, it is poetry that is uh, that what is what haunts us, um, because it, it it's it's kind of cites and encourages, and and pushes us to what we should or may or could become. It is from this future, always already a feminist future, that de Burgos poetry speaks to us. Vanessa's title then identifies the genius of Julia de Burgos, since the poet's injunction to us is what we commit, is that we commit to a state of becoming. Edward Glissant, the great Caribbean philosopher uh, and a mentor of mine in the Graduate Center used to say to me, Richard, I write for a reader in the future, as if to intimate that the readers of his work had not yet arrived. I think Vanessa's book suggests that these readers that de Burgos and Glissant yearn for in, in, in her own life have indeed arrived. And yet the poetic beyond de Burgos insisted on has made, thanks to Vanessa's efforts, been made ever more accessible. And as Vanessa's reading of de Burgos suggests, perhaps it is not just to reformulate Glissant's phrase that writers write from the future to a future audience, but that the future belongs to those who read. And that reading poetry endows us in the present with a gift, with an insight into what could come next, what, what we can reform, what is, bef what is before and beyond us, revealing the capacity, as Vanessa puts it, to continually imagine new possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we have questions and comments, but we'll, we'll, if you don't mind, we'll hold off on that until, until the end, and uh, we'll come back to questions for Professor Perez. I uh, would like to uh, introduce now uh, Virginia Sanchez Corral. Professor uh, Sanchez Corral is a professor of Puerto Rican studies at Brooklyn College. Her work is well known to many of us, and I'll just be uh, uh, brief in mentioning some of that work. She is the author of From Colonia to Community, The History of Puerto Ricans in New York, in New York City. Among her many publications, uh, I'll just cite one, for example, to give you an idea of, of her work, is In Search of Unconventional Women, Histories, of Puerto Rican women in religious vocations before mid-century. This is a, in a collection titled Unequal Sisters, a Multicultural Reader in U.S. Women's History. She is also co-editor of the Puerto Rican Struggle, Essays on Survival in the U.S. And Professor Sanchez Coro. Thank you. 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 Th
Thank you. Good evening. I'm going to join my condolences as well to the to the memory of uh, of Juan Flores, who was uh, a scholar, an activist, and a dear friend. Uh, his work will continue. His work has influenced everything that we have done in in the field of Latino studies, Afro Latino studies, Puerto Rican studies, and uh, and I could. Uh, I could almost see his influence in the book. Uh, when Vanessa told me that he had read every page, I said, well, he's going to be there tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a few comments. Uh, I, I, I thank you, Richard, for giving such a beautiful um, analysis of the, of the work that Julia de Burgos has, has created, has left us. What is her legacy? I, I think of her more and as, as a person who was part of the Puerto Rican diaspora. I think of her as a New Yorican. In fact, and, and uh, the few comments that I have are just to place her uh, in that co within the context of the uh, Puerto Rican community during the 30s and the 40s, and, uh, and, and, and to tell you why I think that she was such a, a New Yorican. Uh, a person very, very well known to us, uh, not the icon that is distant from us, uh, uh, whose, whose work will lead us to self-discovery, but, uh, but an, an everyday person who walked these streets just like we do today. And uh, that part of the book, to me, uh, was was uh, inspirational, and 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 also it was a find because what I I thought was so many books written about this 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 poet have concentrated on her work, on her tragic death, and um, and um, and her perhaps her 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 belief in independence for Puerto Rico, and then that's it. But Vanessa's book allows us to see the woman who writes to her sister, who lives in New York, who gets lost in New York, who travels the trains, who goes to, to Ellis Island, who goes to, to the important sites in the city, uh, who, who experiences the cold, who experiences the discrimination, who begins to understand what discrimination is uh, against minorities in, in this, this huge city, a topic that is so timely at this very moment. Uh, uh, and she experienced it and is able then to bring it into her literature. That's something that a Puerto Rican writer living in Puerto Rico would not have been able to tell us. And so I'm struck by the fact that Julia de Burgos is a New Yorican. And I, 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 I do not see this life as a tragedy. I see this life as, as something that we should celebrate because she tells us so much about ourselves. I was speaking to uh, uh, Dr. Edna Costa Belén, a professor colleague of ours uh, in Albany, and we happened to mention that we were going to be here tonight talking about the book. And uh, she said to me, uh, you know, when I was growing up in, in Puerto Rico, the only thing that I knew from my education through the public schools and the university was that she wrote Rio Grande de Luisa and, uh, and that she, she wrote other poems about nature and, uh, and, and, and uh, the, even the feminist poems where she talks about her two selves and, and trying to become the real Julia de Burgos. Those were not in the curriculum in the Puerto Rican school system. She said, and she was the first one to point out to me something that I had already been thinking was that Julia de Burgos is a New Yorican. Uh, I was, uh, uh, when I think of her living within our communities and I think of her uh, doing the things that we do, uh, I was also struck by the fact that when she's writing some of her most important essays, which I'd like to get to in a minute, um, I was a little girl growing up in the Bronx, 
you know, she's writing this big essay about D-Day and how the second front is happening and how the next invasion, the, the next part of the invasion is, is going to take place and uh, in pueblos uh, hispanos and I was a little kid making little umbrellas and throwing them out the window to celebrate D-Day because that's what we were doing. I lived in the same world as she lived in and uh, to me that's very, very special. I look particularly at the area of Julia de Burgos living in New York among, uh, among the leading figures of the Puerto Rican community. And you mentioned, you know, you mentioned, uh, of, of course, Pura del Pre and Jesus Colón and uh, 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 Clemente Soto Vélez. Uh, um, uh, What's her name? Uh, who found the pueblos hispano? Este Consuelo la, uh, Lee uh, uh, Tapia, uh, 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 Antonio Corretier. All of these people were revolutionaries. They were Puerto Rican revolutionaries. They were fighting for the independence of Puerto Rico, but not only Puerto Rico, but all of the all of the pueblos hispanos that were that were under dictatorship, including including. Uh, writing essays and uh, supporting anti-fascist forces uh, in Spain. They were very, very, they were ahead of their times in the sense that they were dealing with issues that um, New York City as a whole was not even, was not even aware of. Uh, if you compare newspapers like Pueblos Hispanos or Gráfico, which was a little bit earlier, or Artes y Letras, which was about uh, the same time, as uh, pueblos hispanos, uh, you would see an emphasis on an international phenomenon, international focus. Uh, you would see uh, uh, a dedication to justice, uh, uh, alliance with the with the working class, uh, support of the unions for the working class. This was the vibrancy that was New York City for the Latino community, and this is where she found a home the home that she did not find mm. in Puerto Rico, and she did not find in Cuba, but she found it in New York. Mm. Because in New York, she could begin to be the person that she was, uh, independentista, uh, feminist, uh, uh, supporter of, 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 of causes, particularly the, 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 the political causes. Um, uh, a person who saw Puerto Rico as uh, the Puerto Ricans from here and the Puerto Ricans on the island, as a nation divided by U.S. and U.S. economic structure. I mean, she's she's mm. she's writing these things before anyone else is really doing this type of analysis, and uh, and that to me was uh, was striking, and it was a revelation, and it was what begins to make her a real person. Uh, one of the things that I liked very, very much, well, let me tell you something first about Pueblos Hispano. Uh, that was a, a newspaper. Uh, it came out every week, five cents. There's a beautiful illustration in the book of, of, the, of, of the newspaper. It had, um, uh, it stated its reasons for being, uh, and among the reasons was to unify the colonias hispanas in the United States. Uh, to defeat uh, Nazi, uh, Nazi uh, fascism, to defend the rights of Hispanic minorities in the United States, to, uh, to seek the immediate independence of the nation of Puerto Rico. That, that's, that was the wording, of the nation of Puerto Rico. Uh, to combat prejudice, uh, and prejudice was defined as uh, discrimination based on race, uh, color, uh, creed, they weren't dealing so much with feminism yet, so you have to be a little <laughs> bit patient with that. Uh, nor were they dealing with uh, sexual orientation, but you know, that eventually would happen. Uh, to struggle against Franco, to liberate all the political prisoners of the world. Uh, that one struck me as one of the, one of, one of their, uh, one of the agendas, because um, I never heard anyone talking about liberating all of the political prisoners, think about it, on the world. That, that, that is, that, that is, that's a hard one to take. Mm. I could see liberating some, perhaps not others, but they're saying 
that their agenda is to liberate all of the political prisoners in el mundo, in el mundo, uh, to better the relationships uh, uh, in the Americas through the diffusion of culturas hispanas. Uh, so many uh, uh, organizations uh, working in New York City at this time were working together uh, in unison with one another, and and very very the and the ones that Julia de Burgo, Clemente Sotoveles, um, Consuelo, uh, uh, Lee Tapia, and um, Antonio Correger, uh and I mentioned them particularly because they were socialist or communists. Uh, so many of these organizations uh, saw beyond the immediate needs of their particular community. They really were international in scope. Uh, they wanted, part of the agenda was the immediate liberation of the Philippines. Now, in 1945, when the Second World War was over, the Philippines had not yet, were still colonial, a colonial uh, territory, part of the United States. They were going to be uh, <coughs> liberated, they were going to be given their independence, particularly because of the uh, of the cooperation and the help that they gave the United States during the war, but that that did not happen right away. And and an agenda item for pueblos hispanos was to liberate uh, the Philippines, and also to to uh, to support union solidarity in 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 the Americas, not just in the United States and not just New York. Uh, the newspapers of the times a small newspaper like Pueblos Hispanos, for example. It's not the only one, it had a history. Uh, before you had Pueblos Hispanos, you had newspapers uh, during the 1920s, you had newspapers during the 19th century. Patria, which was the newspaper for the Cuban Revolutionary Party, uh, and uh, the, the goals of the Cuban Revolutionary Party in the 19th century were to uh, free Cuba and to aid the, the independence and to aid in, the, in, in getting the independence for Puerto Rico. Uh, their agenda and, 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 and the items that concerned them and the reasons why they put together a newspaper were not so different from what we see in Pueblos Hispano and not so different from what we see in Grafico. Newspaper. Newspapers in the colonias hispanas throughout the United States began as early as 1818. Uh, in Louisiana, the first newspaper was called El Mississippi, uh, a bilingual newspaper. Well, in New Orleans, the Mississippi River, um, it made a lot of sense. But the newspaper itself was a bilingual newspaper, dealt with the issues affecting the immediate Latino communities in the area. And, um, and from there was able to articulate uh, many of the concerns of, the, of that community. There was no television, there was no radio, there was no telephone, there was no iPhones, there were no iPads. <coughs> you could not tweet the news. The news had to be read and it had to be read in the community presses and that was what Puebla Hispano was. Uh, that, that, let me leave it there. Um, okay. I think he was trying to tell me. <laughs> no, no, no. No. <laughs> what? Go ahead. no, you didn't see him like waving or anything. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. We'll leave it there and take some questions and answers. We'll come okay. back to it. We'll come back to it. <laughs> Thanks so Thank much. You. Thank you. Well, I think you could see how much uh, how much there is to say about Julia de Burgos, and in okay. particularly in how many directions <laughs> we can go. Um, I, I think we can agree then uh, that the presence of Julia de Burgos in New York today is, is iconic. Her name and her image haunt this city. I, I remember being so many times on the M60 bus to LaGuardia Airport. You mm -hmm. go on 125th Street, there's Julia de Burgos. And in places, unexpected places. But these images of Julia de Burgos, powerful as they are, are, are one-dimensional. At the same time, some of the stories and the legends about Julia de Burgos are artifacts that beguile us, but that can also flatten a web of 
complex realities mm -hmm. as we have seen. Mm -hmm. Vanessa's book acknowledges the power of the icon, the power of those images, but also maps out a territory that is rich and complex. The book, to me, the book suggests strategic points in the biography and in the works of Julia de Burgos, places that have generated important work, but also areas that remain rich ground for work yet to be done. In readings of Julia de Burgos, one can often detect a recurring tension, and I just want to stop on that for a minute, a tension between the personal story, we've, we've also seen the, um, Richard discuss this, the personal story of Julia de Burgos and the Julia that we encounter in her work. Mm. The biographical narrative is familiar to, to many of us. It is a story about origins in the poor village of Carolina, about the struggle to overcome the limits of those origins and find a personal voice in writing. It is a story of love lost and found, an exile in Cuba, in New York. Like any good story, it has an ascending curve, then a point when the climb begins. Julia is alone, abandoned in the city, in poor health, in and out of the hospital. And finally, she's nameless. She's dying without an identification, without an identity on the street. Then we have a bittersweet but triumphant coda. She is found and returned to her native land, to her origins, and her poetry lives on. It's a powerful story, an urban legend at this point. And I want to return to it in just a moment. But the other side of this tension then are the, what I would say are the close readings of Julia de Burgos, the critical readings. And there are many valuable such readings. Now we have Vanessa's own reading. Mm. These readings reveal, I think they reveal gaps in that story. Omissions, uh, dramatic hyperboles. So after this closer readings, critical readings, what do we do with this legend, with this, with this iconic legends? It is a popular narrative, but uh, as serious readers, we question it. I think one of the values of Vanessa's book is that it does not set one narrative against the other. The flawed legend in one corner and the close critical reading on the other. Both coexist in the book and establish a fruitful tension that we need to consider any time that we approach the life and works of Julia de Burgos as, as we've done this year celebrating uh, her life. Uh, briefly, I want to return to a point in this legend that we've talked about, the legend of Julia Burgos, and that is because it, it, it attracts me. It's this death without a, an identification. Uh, this touches a nerve. Uh, it, it, it does for me anyway. Because it is death without, without an identification but without identity. Um, this is a book showing Julia de Burgos as rooted in one identity, her origin in Puerto Rico, yet searching for others here in New York as a woman, a poet, an exile, a Latina in New York. Mm. This death without identity is undone by Julia's return home and by her writing, a space of constant resurrection because to read is to resurrect, a gesture, a place, a voice, mm. And there lies its power. These things that are gone are resurrected when we read. So this ending without a name, I think, becomes many names. And there lies its power also. Death without a name becomes the name of every Puerto Rican freezing in a barrio basement or sweating it out on the streets of Alphabet City. Vanessa's book suggests that this place without a name that for a moment was Julia de Burgos dying on a street in New York, is also the source of the many names of exile, not just for Puerto Rico, but for Haitians, Cubans, Dominicans, Mexicans, people that Julia de Burgos met and wrote about right here in New York. La Cosa Latina, she called it, a phrase that she used. 
Julia as a nomadic writer is a powerful topic which recurs throughout the book. A nomad, of course, has no home. But to put it another way, a nomad's home is everywhere. Julia de Burgos nurtures in her writing the images of Puerto Rico as home. She never gives that up. But also she has taken us, contemporary readers of her work, to consider the power of that everywhere, a cosmic mm -hmm. connection. I think Richard already has commented on this. A cosmic connection that we have the option to share with others. I think the icon in Vanessa's book came to be out of that contradiction between a lost origin and the desire not to reclaim it because that is impossible, but to recast the very terms of that desire mm. right here in New York. In that recasting, and in our reading of it, there is no loss, no victim's lament, only power and infinite possibilities. I just want to finish with a, my, one of my favorite uh, uh, lines of poetry from Julio de Burgos, and, uh, and he says like this, Yo fui la más callada, la que saltó la tierra sin más arma que un verso. I was the quietest one, the one who leaped over the earth with no other weapon than a verse. Mm. Thank you. So then we have uh, Vanessa yeah. um, wanted to, uh, to read a, a little bit of yeah. the book and then we can have questions. I am so grateful for all of the, the um, comments on the book. Thank you so much. Um, I, I figured rather than having me talk about the book because the three wonderful scholars here have already done that. I would just read a little bit. I, um, I'm going to read from the section on the letters at, per Virginia's suggestion or request, I should say. Um, in advance, we, we discussed this a little bit and she suggested I read from that section, so I think I'll do that. Um, since it's a section that I haven't read from before in other, in other presentations. And, um, So this is um, the beginning of chapter two from the book. When Julia de Burgos embarked for New York on 13th of January, 1940, she was 25. She had already written three collections of poetry and published two. She had been married and divorced. Stigmatized by Puerto Rico's conservative culture because of her divorce, Burgos left with no plans to return. Burgos' decision to leave the island and spend the remainder of her life abroad generated much criticism, romantic speculation, and gossip among those who believed her departure from the island set in motion a series of events that resulted in her death. In Puerto, Rica, in Puerto Rican literature and expressive culture of the 1940s and 1950s, the narrative of migration as tragedy prevails. Burgos subsequently became a symbol of this tragedy in the collective imagination of many Puerto Ricans both on the island and in New York. However, Burgos migration experience can be read as an escape from victimhood. This chapter follows her migratory routes to New York, to Havana, and back to New York in the larger context of, of Puerto Rican migration. Um, and then in this chapter, I look at her second and third collection of poetry and also um, some of her, a selection of her letters. And um, determine that her experience of migration um, no longer appears as victimization when we study these letters and um, collections of poetry closely, but rather Burgos emerges as an early figure of sexile. Political and economic factors have often been taken into account when studying the reasons for migration from Latin America and the Caribbean to the United States. 
in recent years, scholars such as um, Larry LaFontaine Stokes and other scholars have explored the causal link between sexuality and migration. Theorist Manolo Guzman coined the term sexile to refer to, I quote, the exile of those who have had to leave their nations of origin on account of their sexual orientation, close quote. This chapter extends the definition of sexile to include heterosexual women who have been excluded and displaced because of because they are deemed sexually transgressive within patriarchal and heteronormative discourses. So I'm going to um, skip a bit and look at her letters home where she, be, in these letters that are written from both New York and Cuba, we can see her developing a broader sense of, of identity, a, a sense of identity that's more hemispheric. If we expand the definition of sexile to include the expulsion of women from the immediate family of the nation because they do not conform to traditional gender roles, we can see how the term applies to Julia de Burgos. Her first, collections, her first two collections of poetry attest to her desire to break social norms for women. Burgos' personal letters reveal that she saw Jimenez Grullón as a means of escaping island politics and fulfilling her dr dream of becoming a world-known poet. While her exile certainly brought her isolation, loneliness, and despair, traveling abroad also gave her opportunities to grow as a writer and provided her with alternative perspectives. She crossed borders in both her writing and her personal life. Um, Burgos left Puerto Rico on January 13, 1940, aboard the San Jacinto and arrived in New York City five days later. She was excited at the possibilities that this new life might afford her. On the day of her arrival, she wrote to her sister, and I'm going to read a quote from um, one of the letters. In the book, I, I offer the original in Spanish and a translation. I think for the sake of time today, I'll just read the translation. What, uh, and this is um, a, a quote. What matters now is that you know I am fulfilling my destiny beside the one who will always be my tender beloved, and to you a loving brother. I am in awe. I had a pleasant journey, full of surprises. My emotions and senses were captivated, at times, by wonderful, wonderful currents of yellow al algae in the Atlantic, and at other times, by fantastic clouds on the horizon shaped like cruise ships. Approaching New York, there was a beautiful snow shower. I disembarked. Writing to her sister um, a couple weeks later on January 13th, on January 30th, 1940, just a few days after arriving in New York, Woodgoss described her excitement. Um, her sense of adventure highlights the differences between Puerto Rico and the metropolis. She marveled before the expansive city, the modern forms of public transportation. She used English words um, that started to make their way into her writing. Um, as in her poetry, Burgos' letters and other writings from New York emphasize walking and movement. Though she highlighted this, though here she highlights the cityscape rather than the rural landscape. These letters are examples of this nomadic consciousness that paralleled the rejection of fixed norms of identity expressed in her writing. And here's another um, quote in translation. Every day opens new horizons, and every step is a marvel of new sensations. I explored quite a bit of the city and got lost several times. This fervor I have for daring to try everything led me, after being here for only two days, to venture out alone by bus. The systems of communication are very complicated here. Imagine nine million inhabitants in the radius of the city, most on foot, as there is very little family life here. People push each other on the buses, in shops, in cafes. For all these people, there must be trams and subways and elevated trains that change direction at each corner, and one must be an expert at this complicated web. After having been here for only two days, feeling very sure of myself, I went for a ride on a double-decker bus and ended up unknowingly in Long Island, a part of the city that is quite remote and separated by an enormous bridge. 
Two days later, I got lost riding the subway. I walked among, I walked among some of the large underground New York avenues to find my train. That's how you learn, and I have no fear of venturing out alone. Since I know English, it's easy for me to maneuver the city. This is a truly organized town. On the street corner, instead of police, there are red and green lights that automatically indicate to the cars and the pedestrians when it is their turn to cross. In the cafeteria as a kind of cafe, you serve yourself with trays and all. So... It had to be the automat. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think I w I'm going to stop. Wait, let me see. Is that work? Yes, I'm going to stop there. Stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we can open so, up. So um, you've all listened to us patiently. Now, if anyone has any questions, please, for, for, the, for Vanessa, for the panel. Okay. Did she in any way collaborate with uh, uh, the congressman? I'm having a senior moment. Mark uh, Antonio. Vito Mark Antonio in organizing any of the Latino yeah. workers, and also Jesus, De Jesus. Jesus Colón. Yes. Yeah. Uh, she actually did. With Vito Marcantonio? Yes. In fact, uh, the uh, um, th one of the banners on Pueblos Hispano mentions the Marc Antonio project, which was the the independence of Puerto Rico, uh, and uh, and Jesus Colón was a was a frequent writer in those in the newspapers of this time. Mm -hmm. so what's interesting about her her connections at that point was that she was really uh, she was really in in a in, in a circle of, of highly intellectual highly highly motivated very political figures uh, some of whom were going to prison for for their beliefs uh, and and she was there uh, actually writing articles uh, that that criticized uh, the American government that her articles, you were, when you were reading the, the letters, I thought about an article that she wrote on Mexicans for, uh, for Pueblos Hispano. And, by, and you put that at the end of that chapter, I, I, and I wondered whether there was a reason for, for that, for, put, for locating it where you did. But she sees a group of Mexicans on the train, on the, on the train station, and they look lost. And she, she goes over to them and starts to talk to them. And she's fascinated because she says that you usually don't see, and this was important, you usually don't see uh, groups of people of one ethnicity together. Usually it's, 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 it's a mixture of, of, eth of Latino ethnic uh, uh, groups. And uh, she starts to question them about what they're doing. They were so happy that someone who spoke their language had come over to them. And she develops this, this beautiful essay about loneliness and, and being, uh, being in a strange place, uh, being, the, uh, uh, be, being disoriented, being discriminated against because of the color of your skin. Uh, but yes, yeah, she did work with Mark Antonio. She, she, this, actually this image right here, all of these images that are rotating yeah. are images from the book. Um, this one right here, this is a flyer where you see she's part, she's, um, part of an event with Jesus Colón um, to advocate for the independence of, of Puerto Rico. And, and she did write up for the newspaper at the same time as Jesus Colón. Jesus Colón was writing a, a column for the paper, and she was the art and culture editor of this paper. So through that paper, she was connected with him. And then they did um, political events. Um, uh, one is concerns um, 
you're, what you're going to do with this material. And I saw a lot of about Jose Martin, there's like everything he ever wrote is published and indexed and cataloged. And we need something similar for Julio de Burgos. <laughs> we need that kind of commitment and investment to the magnitude of her person. And your book like begins to do that, um, sort of construct her as an intellectual, mm -hmm. not as a subject of gossip and cheese Um But I just wonder, you know, if there are plans to publish these beautiful letters, um, the work in Puerto's Hispanos, I think it's it's so mm -hmm. important and would be so valuable mm -hmm. for teaching and for kind of doing more to recuperate the community from that era. And then I know you mentioned you have other projects on the horizon. I'd love to hear more about those. So the the letters the um, Julia de Burgos's niece in Puerto Rico is in is publishing the letters. I'm not sure what the publication date is. I thought it was going to be this year. No, it is. It is. It's this year. So I guess in the next few weeks. We've got three weeks left of the year, so in the next three weeks it'll be out. Um, it, they're supposed to be out this year. Those, I, my understanding is that they're being published in Spanish, right? They're not, be, they're not translated yet. They're not translated. So, and then the, um, there was a very limited release of the, of the newspaper articles that were published um, in the 90s by the Ateneo Puerto Rican when they did a celebration of her, I think it was 92 or 96, something like that. Um, but I am publishing those in translation, a bilingual edition with Arte Publico Press will be publishing them and hopefully that should be out next year, 2015, maybe towards the end of 2015, but those are, mm -hmm. are coming out in translation. So we'll have those, those other, um, do, you know, writings by Julia de Burgos available. Um, so that's your translations? Yes, They're I'm translating the, them. I'm translating them. There's also these Jack Agüero's translations. That would be interesting to see where Jack Agüero's translated the essays? He, he didn't publish them, but it's uh, like, uh, they on the, no, not the essays, the- The letters, the he letters. translated the letters. I'm translating the essays. Yeah, oh, okay. Yeah. But the letters, yeah, he did. The, I'm yeah. just thinking that it would be good to just check the, the mejor todavía si solo si tú lo tuyo solo es ensayo porque se podía mirar esas traducciones and work with them maybe yeah uh, the letters yeah like for the future because I saw like he has a he was he translated the letters he translated the letters but I don't my understanding is that he did not have permission there the permission to publish the translations is not has not yet been given exactly, by no. the family, and I discussed yeah. I discussed the possibility of translating the letters with the family, but they wanted to publish them in Spanish first. So perhaps in the future, exactly. that perhaps in the future the translation could come, but but they wanted to publish them in Spanish um, first. So. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations, Vanessa. Thank I'm wondering you. if you could talk about uh, maybe race uh, uh, and maybe as it relates to a term like Latina, uh, which I think is this fascinating given the context mm -hmm. of Puerto Hispano that you sketch in your work. I'm thinking of the kind of pan Hispanic right, uh, politics of Puerto Hispano and that was that tied into right global politics at the time, good neighbor policy, so, mm -hmm. so kind of from the top and from the bottom, right? Uh, but then also the ways in which uh, you know, Latino or Latina might might mean or might not mean, right? The ways in which we use the term now, I think both might be the case, right? Uh, and then what, what happens, right? If you think of of uh, who is Latina, right? Uh, is there a tension there with thinking of her as you know, uh, diaspora Puerto Rican? I'm thinking of one's one's work, for example, like the, mm -hmm. the, the kind of arguments that he made, uh, and and in terms of blackness or brownness, and given how shifting, right, representations of Julia's race have been both on the island and in the diaspora. So just race in general, and then do you think Latina Latina has a kind of race value, or or uh, and how does it connect to how that term was being used uh, in, uh, in in that moment in New York? That, uh, that's a really good question because I think, I mean, the way that we have to assume that the way that the term was being used in the 40s um, meant something different, perhaps, than what it means right now in terms of the way that, I mean, if we think of, for example, Juan's um, 
essay, which you you highlighted, I think, this week um, on social media, the dias New York diaspora city, right? The way that the Latina has be or the term Latino has become part of this idea of consumer identities and what it meant um, in in the 40s. The, the interesting thing, I think, about what they do in the letters that they, they kind of go back, not the letters, excuse me, the essays. The essays go back and forth between using at times the term Latino or referring to la cosa Latina and referring to Hispano. She uses them both. She uses both terms. Um, and, and there was in that time period, the 1930s, this whole promotion of of Hispanidad and, and com especially with the migration of um, many who were fleeing Spain at that time during the Spanish Civil War and here in New York. But, but I think one of the things that's interesting about her is that, that she still seems to affirm uh, a heterogeneous, um, a mix kind of a mixed identity, at least at a minimum, uh, but affirm a sense of blackness and affirm a sense of indigeneity in her construction, even though she uses this term hispano. I think in that one essay, there's the one essay that's called La Función, oh, I can't remember the title of it off the top of my head. but. It's, like, it's something about the social function of, of culture. And she writes about the, the importance of promoting Hispanic culture, but still that idea of Hispanic culture is still celebrates um, indigenous cultures and African cultures. So I think that her, that, that even though she uses that term, it means it still there's always that affirmation of of uh, heterogeneous identity Latin American heterogeneous identity. Um, and the other part of your question was thinking about her as Latina. You mean, or thinking of her about her as a diasporic subject? Yeah, it's about race, just more, uh, oh. generally given you know, thinking blackness or brownness and how those terms mean and don't mean the same thing on the island and in the diaspora and in the context of pan Latin American politics. So, I mean, do you have a sense of well, the thing she does is just she what those terms like mean? Uh, part of Latin America. Yeah, one, one of the points that she makes is uh, she admonishes people for not considering Haiti as part of Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, she would have probably said the same thing about Brazil, uh, given her, given her, her the way of, that she thought. So that was that was striking, and that, that, that really supports what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm wondering because, given that you're, you've talked about her internationalism and that she, they were uh, dealing with so many issues, political issues that were maybe ahead of their time back then, with this consciousness of, of worldliness, and uh, so they were they going more after Betance's kind of cosmo cos cosmopolitan ideology. Even though it was the era of Albizu Campos, which was more of a nationalism that was inward looking, how did they reconcile that, especially, which seemingly seems like a contradiction, but especially with the existential and important role that New York played in her life, like Virginia was saying, like she really became her, her most self here, like, but at the same time the political agenda was denouncing the country which actually has this city. <laughs> So I don't know. Is, is it ex, is it a approach anywhere in, in you know this? Is it, it is. made conscious? Is, is she aware of of these tensions? Maybe. Yeah. Well, one. Um, Betances is a good place to look because both Betances and and someone like Lola Rodriguez de Dio, not no, someone like Lola Rodriguez de Dio and Betances both uh, espoused a, uh, a, 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 a pan-Hispanic, a pan, uh, they, they, they're talking about the Antillian, uh, the Antillian nation. Uh, and uh, and they, they, given their, given their writings and their, their perspectives on this, I, I've 
I, I don't know that you mentioned it, but she certainly would, would have known that. And the other one is Marti, who, was, um, who also, whose ideas were also incorporated into much of the thinking of, uh, of, of those intellectuals. And uh, she's, um, when I say that she's a New Yorker, I, I, I qualify that by saying that she's a, a New Yorican. <laughs> she is a New Yorker, the way we all are New Yorkers and still maintain uh, a sense of ethnicity and a sense of, uh, of uh, nationalism. Uh, of always wanting that independence for the island and always thinking about the, the importance of, uh, of promoting Puerto Rican culture, it doesn't seem to conflict with her ideas of wanting to think about Puerto Rican culture as something different, I think, than in, in a lot of ways, I think her ideas of Puerto Rican nationalism were in conflict with, with some of the ideas that were being promoted on the island at the time. I mean, I think it's, it's, it's in her, it's clear to me from the early, early writings that there were idea, there were pieces of the Puerto Rican nationalism from the 1930s that she challenged in her writing. Um, and, and a lot of it is a, a nationalism that was very patriarchal, a, a very patriarchal nation that she, that she didn't see her, where she fit in that, those ideas. And, and she was certainly, a, um, and I think that she, she, well, maybe she said it best in her own poetry that she's um, multiple and full of contradictions, and that, and she lives with that. She's able to exist with those tensions in a way that I think is very um, ahead of its time, very postmodern, if you will. Just able to to li exist in the contradiction and not um, not have an issue with that. As if you were what? As if it makes the present like a stone. I don't know if that was, I don't remember if that was something that she had written or if that was your take on something that she had written. But I was really struck by that um, because she is someone that is so iconic in not just Puerto Rican and Caribbean, but in Latin American literature, especially being female. Uh, and we are here looking at someone who celebrated her 100th birthday and not a maybe like a month ago. So I wonder what, uh, what, mm -hmm. uh, first I want to remember if, if it's that something that you had written, if it was something she had said or something you chose to say. About, I, about the way about, I, about the way we look at the past. The way I situated her in the future, even though she's this kind of past figure, right? That is to say, the way I kind of shifted her as, a, you know, her poetry, that is to say, uh, that her poetry, in fact, speaks to us from a kind of future place, right. is what I tried to argue. Yeah, there was the, yes, I remember that there was the construct of you must leave yourself out in order to, poetry is for the future reader. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think there was also something mentioned about the present being uh, stifled if you look too much in the past. Yeah, absolutely, right, that there are certain forms or narratives of the past that aim to create a kind of continuation that becomes dangerous. And it was something that Julia de Burgos was worried about, right? That is to say, the nationalism of the 1930s, which begins this text, and which in some ways begins Julia de Burgos, um, that kind of nationalism was an attempt to uh, imprint the present with the past so that the, so that the present wouldn't be transformative, right? So, so Burgos was interested in a kind of transformative moving beyond a certain kind of patriarchal nationalism. And I would even go further. I would even say that all forms of nationalism for her were utterly uncomfortable, and for me, utterly uncomfortable, precisely because they become dogmatic, right? There's a kind of religious, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. a zealot yep. kind of preaching that, that comes with uh, the fetishizing and the idealizing of the past. 
And this is why, for me, poetry always already talks to us from the future, right? Uh, this is why, for her, she was so interested in, in almost terms that, that, that weren't even literary. They were almost like physics terms, like infinity, right? Because I do think that there's a way in which literature tries to speak to realities that we can't see and that we don't quite un yet understand, right? Like what? Uh, I've been reading a lot of physics lately, right? So now I have all these physics metaphors, like dark matter, right? So how does dark matter work in physics? The whole function of dark matter is that it's the matter we can't see and yet that it shapes our existence. And there's a way in which uh, I think poets are fascinated with, with a, a series of ideological uh, existences and realities that we live within and yet that aren't always, that they're kind of incohate, right? That they, they, they're hard to describe, they're hard to wrestle against, they're hard to fight. There's a wonderful uh, text by Michelle Cliff, wonderful line in a Michelle Cliff uh, essay where she said, it's not enough to be fluent. You have to have the capacity to reveal. And then the question becomes, what does revelation mean in that instance? And there is a way in which Burgos is always pushing towards and pushing beyond this notion of just explaining or describing and trying to uh, push us into this notion of revelation, whatever that means. I know that that doesn't clarify anything, but neither does her poetry, right? <laughs> that's, the, that's the whole point, right? The whole point is that you read the poetry and it insistently creates a complexity that you live within.